two minutes to uh, express uh, uh, Dr. Corlett's um, uh, note that he sent us. Uh, Dr. Corlett is the provost of McEwen University, vice president of research, and uh, he was fully intending on being here. Uh, and then uh, the provincial government called some sort of meeting where of all the vice presidents of research and uh, he apologizes but he can't be here. He sent the following two uh, paragraphs after having read uh, uh, I think the papers that were presented. He says, there's an inherent tension between university autonomy and government's imposition of quality assurance processes. Universities in democratic societies thrive on the tenets of academic freedom whereby individual faculty have the right and responsibility to explore knowledge in an open, honest, and rigorous way. This freedom extends to the creation of curricula in programs of study and to the pedagogical means by which they disseminate that knowledge. Universities themselves have long created collegial governance mechanisms whereby academic freedom is practiced in a culture of obligation to society and to the students of the universities. No freedom is absolute. As American Supreme Court Justice White long ago stated, freedom of speech does not give you the right to stand up in a crowded theater and yell, fire, if there is no such fire. Similarly, academic freedom does not mean that faculty can teach ballroom dance in a calculus course because they wish to do so. That is why universities have collegial bodies, senates, faculty councils, departmental councils to ensure that the university's pursuit and transmission of knowledge is conducted in a way that benefits society by providing all ideas the opportunities to be explored and either accepted or rejected in the marketplace of thought and ideas. What then is the role of government in adding an additional layer of quality assurance to what universities already do collegially, self, uh, do as collegial self-governing bodies? As public institutions, uh, universities are obligated to be socially responsible and to use public funds wisely, efficiently, and effectively. Therefore, it is not unreasonable that governments will see themselves as having a duty to oversee the activities that universities undertake. The question then is how governments can provide that oversight without intervening in the collegial governance and academic freedom that defines the best of university activity. Can such tension ever be fully resolved? Does government ideology, however benign or extreme, have any role in determining what universities research and teach? Who is best positioned to know what knowledge is valuable and worth studying and teaching? Democratic governments have different ways of addressing these issues, and Dr. Kvit's paper provides an interesting foundation to explore this in the context of modern post-Soviet Ukraine. That's his comment.